So, Adam, um, your business is called Doozy Turf. Let me get out the way and everyone can see you and your business entrance over there. Fantastic. Um, tell me, before we, we're going to chat a bit about Doozy Turf a little bit later, um, but one question I've been dying to ask you, um, is it grass? Are you in the grass business? Oh, uh, yes, yeah. Well, uh, so we only grow the best grass. But we only grow the best grass. grass. <laughs> Not the grass you're thinking of. Uh, so we uh, specialize in uh, uh, instant lawn, which basically is a uh, uh, grass they use in your domestic household or a sports field. Uh, sometimes in engineering works, they use it for erosion control. Um, but yeah, it's a nice little simple uh, uh, line of products. We've got three From what you've just uh, said now, um, you, you first got to figure out what works right. and what doesn't work for this particular area within a country. This is what we recommend, and we've built it up over the last five years of testing until it's you know until we're happy with it, and you know here we go. So I guess that's the differentiator then between you know between the different companies that that uh, that provide this product. It's really the product, and it's the experience and the knowledge. Yeah, one, one of the challenges we do find is. Uh, so, like you say, the guys on the side of the road, and that, a lot of people uh, perceive grass as just being grass. Yeah. Uh, um, and actually, if you dig deep into it, there's different types of grasses, of course. But there's also different quality of grass. Uh, um, so, where one person is saying, oh, well, I just want some grass over here, uh, we have a challenge in the market sometimes. Uh, it's inferior quality, and often the guys will charge a lot less because they're aware of that. But uh, to the guy on the ground, they're like, oh, budget, this is what I'm going to go with. And um, often it can be a bit of a mistake because then what happens is they, they go the cheap route and then eventually uh, we get called them later to come and sort it out. Or, um, so so, it's, um, so uh, we're busy trying to develop another brand. For that. You, say, you said you something said very interesting. Now that what people will do is go and buy cheap. Uh, it'll solve the initial problem, but in the long run, they're probably going to have to replace it or it's not going to deliver. Um, I'm just thinking in retail, think of a bed. You know, guys want to buy a bed and they spend eight hours, six hours a night on a bed and they want to go and pay one triple nine for a bed as an example. They want to spend 2K on a bed where they're spending a quarter of their day. It solves the, and it's 100% the exact same principle. It solves the short-term need but in the long term, you know, within three months, six months, 12 months, they're going to need to replace it. And over a period of 20 years, they're probably going to replace it 10 times, you know, whereas if they just invested in a decent bed. Um, and I would imagine this is the same as well. If, if people understand that they are, they're not just paying you for the product, based on what you said earlier on, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've, had, I've lived in different parts of the country and I've had different lawns. Um, my current lawn isn't really a lawn. It's one of those beautiful things about Gauteng is when you run barefoot across the lawns here, the lawn actually sticks to your feet uh, and they call it devil thorn. So it's like a devil's lawn that, that, ra that, that rages around here. And that's something that I'm battling with is to get rid of, of those thorns. But you, what you're paying for is when you, when, when you approach somebody like, like your business is you're not just paying for the product. You're paying for the knowledge and, um, you know, what's going to work, what's not going to work. I mean, ultimately, if somebody wants to put Kukui in the wrong part of the country, then so be it. But they're probably going to have to replace, um, you know, if, you it's, know, if it's the wrong, wrong product. If you match the need correctly, prices are secondary. Um, if somebody understands that if they're going to buy cheap, they're going to replace often, that's great. No problem. It suits your budget now. No problem. But understand your lawn might not take, it might not solve, it might, you might not get the coverage that you want. And in a year's time, you might be knocking on my door for another bag. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so the other part of that is, is uh, I guess, um, to hit the nail home, is, is a correct information or education of, of what uh, the end goal is. And of course, uh, like you rightly say, there's different paths to each end goal. Um, so we try, from our point of view, is to try say, listen, this isn't the best fit. Maybe a lawn isn't actually the answer in this area because there's too much shade or you've got dogs running around in that area. Rather, let's put a little flower bed in there or what may. Um, and we find we, we get quite a good uh, response um, if we upfront front guys and say, listen, you know, it'll work for six months. 
that after six months, you know, we'll see you again. And, you know, it's great for us to get more business, but we need to be aware of, of, the, of the risk. Um, so, for example, we have an issue with a nursery, little nursery schools for kids. And uh, we've got lots of little feet at every tea time running around there. And um, so there's three or four of them that we replace every year for them. And they say, no, they want the lawn, they want the lawn, so that's fine. But, um, you know, as a long-term thing, as long as they're aware that, um, you know, uh, there's certain conditions it's not actually right for. Uh, maybe an artificial lawn might be better suited. Um, so we try to give them all the options and, and then, and then uh, often we find, you know, they, they at least come out satisfied and they're aware of, of, of what can and can't happen. Okay, so let me ask you some questions that I'm sure a lot of listeners would like to know um, the answers to. First of all, which areas do you guys cover in terms of your deliveries of your product? So uh, currently we, we operate um, the whole of uh, KZN uh, extensively. So uh, we're quite lucky. We've got a, a, a setup here where we're able to transport larger volumes. Uh, which means we can travel further for the same price. Um, which all kind of adds up to savings for the clients. Um, so we operate the whole KZN, and then uh, you know as far as south as in Tata, we've sent grass down to East London, uh, you know, Pontefontein, um, and it's really all about uh, the demand. Uh, we've got a specialist lawn here that uh, some of the golf courses like, so we send that out, um, or they come and collect. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, throughout the whole of KZN, we'll help with the doorstep. Uh, and then do you, do you guys um, suggest one specific type of lawn for all residential areas across the areas that you cover? Or would is there different types of lawns that or grass that, that they should be aware of? So another um, thing I'm saying is if I stand on Tata or Bazana, or Durban, or Peter Maritzburg, or Ladysmith, is there a difference, or plant. is there a specific? So, uh, in, in the early days when we first started, uh, uh, we, we produced uh, Kuyu, and Berea, and uh, Buffalo, and uh, some Sinod. We found, uh, actually, that uh, it confused the market a bit. Um, okay. So, what, what, what we then did was said, okay, well, guys, the Berea, we know it grows in the shade. We know it grows in full sun. We know it grows on the coast. We know it grows in Newcastle. So we use that as our go-to for our domestic law, uh, particularly in the coastal areas. Yeah, it, it uh, does better than the Kukuyu. Uh, that's not to say that inland um, uh, Kukuyu isn't a viable option, but we found that they compete uh, uh, quite evenly there. There's a slight disadvantage with the Berea, uh, with the frost. Um, it does uh, crisp up a little bit more than the Kukuyu. But uh, we find that the, you don't have to water as much. And so often, given the choice, people still end up taking the Berea. So what we did consequently was focus largely on the domestic side with the Berea grass because we'd, um, yeah, largely, well, we'd been so successful with that variety. Okay, and then... Um, it you spoke about shade earlier on. Shade uh, is, is, is traditionally a bit of a grass killer. Um, I've noticed that under trees normally there's no grass, so that's what leads me to that conclusion. Is there any solution for that? Um, is there a specific type of grass that um, you know, someone could use in a shaded area that would survive, or is there a, a process that they can implement at home you know, to try and cover up those areas? So there's a couple of uh, uh, things to be aware of. So you, you need to um, be aware of how, how much shade is in the area. And it's, it's quite a difficult one to judge. But So we use a percentage rate. And, um, you know, sometimes you might get morning sun or sometimes you might get afternoon sun. But uh, so we like to say if in a 10-hour in a period that you have six hours of kind of dappled shade um, that – these species will work. If it's a bit more than that, there is a variety called Kursen. We don't stop at promotion. It's quite difficult. And often that one is uh, better to go to the neighbor's yard and nick a bit and use some runners there. And uh, um, so those are your kind of shade options. If it's, they'll do about 80%. If it's more than 80% shade, 
then um, we often recommend go and plant grass, maybe plant some nice delicious monsters there or, or big leaf shady plants. Okay. And if you have got a shady area, uh, some of the tips are the guys go and rake it every week. And, and, um, and it's not great for the, the plant because you'll have um, your, your runners there and every time the rake comes, it'll lift a runner and the little roots that grow on the bottom there get disturbed. And it's fine once or twice, but if you do that every week, then you'll find that uh, those roots, they just like schism and you can't catch a break here and they eventually uh, um, die and wither. Um, so you want to try avoid raking too often under there, which I know you've got leaves on the tree. So a blower mower is usually quite a good option. The second thing is you want to keep your mowing height um, a lot higher than it is in full sun. And what that does, it does uh, two things. It allows you have more surface area for the leaf to capture more sunlight. Okay. And um, the second thing is the higher height uh, covers the soil a bit better and it, and it um, stops the seeds from germinating. Uh, you will still get some uh, odd weeds and stuff germinating, uh, but the, the incidence drops uh, from there. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there are some tips to manage it. Um, obviously, the first prize, uh, because you're growing an organism, um, your soil medium has to be tip-top. Okay. You know, if you've got terrible soil, it doesn't matter what you do, it's going to struggle. Um, so, uh, that's first prize. And, and really, when you're growing lawn, you're actually growing roots, and, and the leaves are, are the byproduct. So, if you've got good, healthy roots, your lawn will uh, look after itself. Fantastic. So, uh, and then that's the shaded areas. So, um, an area that's in harsh sunlight all day. Well, when I say all day, you know, pretty much is from the time from sunrise to sunset. Um, you don't really have to be too concerned about um, about the area getting too much sun, I guess. Or do you, do you have to increase your watering cycle if you're really in a sunny area? Yeah, so um, in sunny areas, generally you would water more than in a shady area. Um, and that's largely because the plants transpire a bit quicker there, the soil dries out. Um, maybe there's a bit of sunlight on the soil. It's not ideal in that case. You, you want to, like for example, if you're going through a drier period, you let the grass grow out a little bit taller than normal. Through a wet period, you can cut it down a little bit lower. Um, but that also being said, there's correct tools to maintain it as well. Um, you know a lawnmower versus a brush cutter, you'll get two different results. Um, so uh, it, it depends on what the use of the lawn is. If it's domestic, then uh, certainly you want to keep it nice and long. But if you're doing embankments and you're just trying to stabilize the soil, you know, brush cutters are fine. Uh, you know, it, 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 uh, it'll work as well. But you don't get that lush finish afterwards. But uh, it does the job that it's supposed to in that circumstance. And, and you mentioned um, the quality of the soil. Is it for just for a residential home? What would you recommend if, if the guy is battling to grow it and there's obviously an issue with, with the quality of the soil? Is there any, anything in particular that they need to add? I understand it's going to vary greatly in terms of you know, what, where they are and what's the condition of the soil, but just sort of like a general rule of thumb. So... Um but the first thing is uh, you need to identify what soil you have. Yeah. And um, if you've got a high clay content, um, one of the, you'll notice when it rains, uh, you'll get puddling and pooling of water and it takes a long time to, to drain there. And uh, if you're in a sandy area like in Durban on the beach there or, or that area, you'll have rain and it's dry half an hour later. So what you want to try to do is... Uh, uh, bring both types of soil back to the middle. And for example, uh, with the high clay content, you want to increase the drainage of the soil. Okay. Um, and that performs two functions. You get some uh, air and oxygen in there that helps with the root health. And, um, and, and through flow, and it allows the, the roots to develop uh, uh, more rhizomous structures. And those will then uh, um, have access to better nutrients. So the one way you would do that on a high clay, uh, clay content is that sometimes the guys add uh, a little bit of sand, um, but generally we uh, recommend using compost uh, and like a larger grain compost. And that uh, and you you dig it into the soil, but it's important uh, the guys often just they, they just top dress with it and they think no it's going to be okay. 
And what happens is you create these layers and it becomes a boundary layer. And the roots will grow fine up here and then they'll hit a different type of soil here and then they'll grow laterally. And, and that's not suitable. So when the guys do come to do the compost, they need to mix it in. You want a gradient as opposed to a layer. And that um, it just helps the roots get down uh, a bit further. The same with your uh, uh, sandy soils. Um, if you can add, uh, we have a product here called 50-50 and, and we mix 50% uh, topsoil, we mix 50% uh, uh, compost. And then we say, well, if you've got a sandy soil, use this. You've got a bit of the topsoil that creates more clay particles, a bit of extra nutrients and, and uh, water retention holding uh, capabilities. And then at the same principle, you, you want to create a, a gradient. Uh, and, and as deep as possible, you know, you can get away with 200 millimeters, but if you want to go like 300 millimeters if you can. It's not always possible, but, um, you know, the deeper you go, it does, uh, does help. So, so the best way then to sort out uh, my yard that's full of devil thorns would really be to, to clear it, um, because the sand is also not the greatest and then um, sort of try and put in 300 mils of your 50-50 mix and then replant from scratch, I guess. Well, I think uh, where, we, where you guys are up there, um, you know, I, I don't think you have an issue too much uh, uh, with uh, clay uh, being too, uh, your drainage being too good. Yep. So I would just go straight with a, a compost type uh, related product. Okay. And, um, you know, and the compost, uh, people, it's, it's not about uh, uh, nutrients, the compost. It does help. Uh, uh, actually, actually you get the compost, which isn't, that's a different kettle of fish. But um, you'd mix that in, and, and you, you're trying to improve the soil structure as opposed to uh, improve the fertility. Um, once you've got the soil structure right, and you can come through with uh, like a, more of a top dressing type compost, sometimes they add a bit of chicken uh, manure in it. And that does, uh, then you get the, 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 the green splash back from that. Yeah. With all the burning that's busy happening and the deforestation that's taking place across the planet, I see it's been highlighted now in uh, the Amazon has been burning for a couple of weeks. I'm not sure what those cats are up to on that side, but um, I've noticed that um, there's sort of the varying stats, anything from a football field to 10 football fields a day are being decimated. So... You know, I kind of worry about breathing. Um, you know, what what impact does um, does grass have? You know, is is does grass produce the same sort of volume of oxygen? Does it have the same ability? You know, to absorb carbon, um, if any. So, um, from a oxygen point of view, um, yep. so a general general lawn, a fifty square meter lawn. Um, the guys tell us from Australia that uh, a 50 square meter lawn will, will produce enough oxygen for a family of four daily. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, but bearing in mind, you know, grass isn't just your front lawn. There's over 10,000 species of grass. Uh, for example, it's debatable that a palm tree could be considered a, a type of grass. And, okay. Uh, in some circles, people do call it a grass. Some people don't. But... Um, so you talk about all, all your uh, northern hemisphere, all the steps and that, and they're, they're huge um, carbon sinks, I guess, as it were, and, and uh, are very effective at uh, producing oxygen. So there's also multiple benefits with the lawn in that sense when you're talking about the well-being of the family and breathing. Uh, it acts as an air conditioner around the house there. It, uh, so it absorbs the heat. I mean, I don't know if you stood on the, on the tar road on a hot day yeah. and then and stand on the lawn, there's, there's often a 15, 20 degree difference. And um, so it cuts down on those sort of things. And then also water runoff. You don't lose all the water down the storm drain into the river, back into the ocean. You know, it goes into the water table, soaks in through the grass there, um, cleans out some of the impurities, um, so you know, it's it's uh, all around. It's you know, uh, there's a host of benefits. Um, if you want, yeah. You you mentioned frost earlier on. Um, what what should we be aware of when it comes to grass and frost? So um, the first thing I think everyone should realise is is a large reason why uh, lawns go brown in the winter is is they go into what they call dormancy. Okay. And and that's typically because we. Uh, 
on a summer rainfall country. I know the Cape's a bit different, but um, if you go down in winter in the Cape, you'll see the lawns are green, and, that, and that's a function related to uh, water availability. So if you wish to keep a green lawn throughout the winter, you need to maintain what we would recommend is about 25 millimeters of equivalent rainfall in irrigation uh, once a week. And it's important not to do it every day. It's, it's better to rather do it once a week, uh, give it a good drenching. And what that does is it allows the water to go through the horizon, act as a storage bank uh, in the soil, uh, as opposed to if you water every day for five minutes, then you've got a little bit at the top, which is fine, but then one day you don't water and, and the roots are shallow and they haven't uh, formed deeply, then the lawn will struggle. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that makes sense because often, you know, it's it's either when when you remember to water the lawn or it's um, it's too late. You've seen it turn brown and now you're trying to resuscitate it. So that makes sense. So what you're saying is just get into a regular cycle. Um, make sure you've got a bit of compost. Feed the lawn. Make sure you've got the right type of grass and get into get into a watering cycle. Would you suggest so the same day? I mean, it's a subjective thing. Uh, you know, sometimes if we're having a 40 degree week, you might want to irrigate twice. Deeply. Okay, um, got you. Yeah. So I'm afraid that there's no silver bullet. Uh, sure. for that. Um, you know, obviously if we're having rain, we don't need to water. So, yeah. uh, you know, you, you need to take a bit of initiative. It's quite a difficult one to explain, but um, if people understand the concept that if the soil is dry, you need to drench it properly. Yep. Then uh, you know how quickly that becomes dry is, is depends on the weather. And there's this whole myth that um, only extremely wealthy people can afford um, instant lawn. Um, you know, us normal folk, if if our lawn is a problem, we'll we'll try and, like you said, steal runners from the neighbour or cross the road and just you know put them down and cross your fingers and see what happens. And if it takes, fantastic. We'll tell everyone what. You know how green our fingers are, and if it doesn't take, we just won't talk about it. Um, but um, what what re what type of costs are you in for? Um, you know, if if to to buy instant lawn from you guys. Put this into kind of a bit of context. So if 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 you have an average house that has a hundred square meter lawn, I would say you know to get it done properly, you're looking at about plus minus five thousand rand um, uh, to get it installed. There are cheaper alternatives, uh, seeding or doing runners, and it's a bit like your bed story, you know, you kind of pay for what you get, but um, they don't tell you about the headaches later on, you've got to continue to water for much longer, you've got to continue to uh, weed for much longer. So although your initial cost is uh, lower for some of those products, uh, usually, uh, so for example, if you bought a packet of seed, you know, it might cost you about 18 rand a square meter. Um, Whereas your instant lawn might cost you 36 rand a square meter, but it's done. That's that's your work done. You got to water it for two weeks and start May. Your lawn, your seed, you 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 know you must come back next week and oh, have you planted in the right season as well? So it needs to be warm for it to germinate, and uh, you must water it. And then of course now you water it, you prep the soil, and that takes a lot of effort. And uh, now you water it, but a whole host of other seeds come up, <laughs> which you don't want. So then you must go back and, and continuously weed it until the lawn's matted. And it can take anywhere between three and six months uh, for seeds to establish properly. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a catch-22. Um, and it's the same with runners, it's the same concept. Um, so you can do it cheaper. But I, in my personal opinion, I think they probably cost about the same, uh, you know, over a six-month period. Yeah. Uh, um, so okay. one... For, you know, 5,000 rand, really, I mean... If you go and carpet a room, um, you know, you're probably in, depending on which carpet you select, but you're probably in for about 5K anyway, just for a carpet. So it's it's really it's really not that expensive. I thought you were going to say something like 15,000, 20,000 Rand for 100 square meters. I mean, 5,000 Rand is, is, is really not much. And if you think about the fact that you're getting oxygen, you know, and that's, that's just, you know, that's just reality. I mean, there's all those side benefits, you know, from family time, you know, there's immeasurable benefits. I just can't think of a lawn. better investment around your house than having a nice lawn that's offering you enjoyment. It's give, it's instant, as you said, there's no hassles. And I, I would even hazard a guess that over a six month period, it's probably more expensive to go the, the cheaper route. I don't know enough about it, but 
um, based on what you've said and from my previous experiences with loans, I would say that it's probably going to be cheaper to get the instant loan put in, no hassle, no fuss. And um, yeah, I love the idea of oxygen production. I mean, that just makes perfect sense in my mind. Um, yeah, she's Adam, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you today and educational. Uh, I didn't think I would spend this much time talking about glass, <laughs> um, but I've so, really, really enjoyed it. Everybody that's listening out there, you know, don't, don't go and pave that area around your house. Go put instant lawn, air condition your house, you know, get your nasal passages working, get hold of these guys. Where are you guys based? Well, I'm assuming Doozy has got something to do with the Doozy River. Yes, yeah. So we we neighbours uh, of the Doozy. We're based in Peter Maritzburg. Um, so we service the whole of the Durban area, Ladysmith, Newcastle, Eastern Cape. Um, yeah, we've got teams out uh, every weekend, and uh, if we can help, yeah, please give us a shout. How do the guys get hold of you? Do they um, just is it just Doozy Doozy Turf dot Coza or Google search, so, Facebook? Yeah, Google search. Um, if you want to pop in for a cup of tea or coffee, you just type in Juicy Turf. It'll take you to the front door. We've got the kettle on the whole time. Uh, we open seven days a week. And uh, we're on Facebook, uh, um, email, Twitter. Uh, we're still learning about that one. But yeah. So, Adam, thanks very go. much for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Um, and thanks for sharing all those insights. No, thanks, uh, Edwin. Yeah, thanks uh, for having me. And uh, yeah, we wish you all the best going forward. Uh, I look forward to some more podcasts. Yeah, 100% for sure. All right, Adam, take care, man. Cheers, Adam. Ciao.